Picking this back up and just to kind of wrap up the last part that we were talking about, that God's plan is consistent. His plan also involved His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Uh, you know, we can see from reading that passage of Scripture that there were at least two things accomplished at the first coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, the restoration in man of the lost image of God, Colossians 3.10 uh, through the death, burial, and resurrection, uh, we can be in Christ in the process of becoming conformed to the image of, of Christ. And then also, so not only the restoration of that image, which, by the way, let me just throw this out there. You're getting a lot of free stuff, you know, the little bunny trails. Uh, another prevalent thing that I seem to be hearing more and more and more is people talking about, you know, even in, regardless of where you go, media and all that is, you know, well, we're all born in the image of God. Okay, so let me just, let me make sure that you understand that you and I were not born in the image of God. We were born in the image of Adam, fallen man. We had the image of Adam, not the image of God, okay? Uh, Adam was created in the image of God. Adam fell. We inherited our nature, we inherited our characteristics from our, fall of, our fallen grandfather. You and I aren't born in the image of God. We lost that image when we sinned. Uh, that sin nature is not the image of God. And, um, you know, this whole philosophy and approach that, oh, we're all born in the image of God, and, well, you know, why can't we all live together, and why can't we all get along, and that's what we should do, and we should all strive for peace, and if we do this, we'll bring about world peace. That's the whole lie out of hell that, you know, mankind is going to produce world peace. Which, by the way, the Antichrist is going to appear to accomplish that. He is going to convince people, and that's one of the key things that's going to convince people that he is the Christ because he is going to have the solution to bring peace in this world. Or so it will appear for three years. And then... Oh, can I say that? All hell's going to break loose, literally. Uh, you know, Satan and the Antichrist turning. Uh, but we're not in the image of we're not in the image of God. We lost that image. When you get saved spiritually, that new creation, then in in the flesh we can become conformed to the image of God. But that confirmation comes from the inside out. And it doesn't happen by you and I making things happen. It's by you and I letting the Holy Spirit bear fruit. And it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not fruits. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit in nine varieties. The love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance, those things that the Holy Spirit will produce in your life and in my life as we die to self and let Him live through us. And so our whole job is to die to self and to let Christ live through us, and then we can come to the conformity, becoming conformed to being like Christ. So that when people look at you and they look at me, they should see Christ. Now, the average person is not going to have any idea what they see. I mean, they, but they should see a difference, should they not? All right? I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. <laughs> Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All right? As you and I grow in Christ... And the rest of that passage of Scripture then talks about the ministry that God has given to you and I. That ministry is the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Of reconciliation. And He's given us the message of reconciliation. So your job and my job, as I said at the beginning, is simply to be witnesses to what we have experienced. That's all, that's all that I can talk about with, without any hesitation. Listen, I can't talk about your salvation and your change, but I can talk about mine. I can talk about what the Lord has done in my life. I can bear witness. Isn't that what a witness is? A witness is somebody that can testify to what they have seen, what they have heard, what they have tasted, what they have experienced. Your job and my job is simply to tell other people what I've experienced. 
it, 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 it's like those lepers, you know, in the Old Testament, that the city was held captive and everybody was starving and everybody was dying and, and they, were, they were killing one another and, and eating each other. And, and these lepers like, you know what? We may as well go out to the enemy camp because whether they kill us or we die here, we're going to die, so let's just go. And they went out to the enemy camp and find that God had driven them all away. And breakfast was sitting there still on the fire waiting to be eaten. And what did those, two, what did those guys do? They finally realized, you know what? <laughs> we better go testify. We better be witnesses of what we've experienced. And even at that, people doubted them. But you know, that's what you and I are supposed to do. We're supposed to be witnessing and testifying of what Jesus Christ has done in us. That, another lie from Satan is to convince you and I that we have to have a certain level of Bible knowledge and certain level of understanding scripturally before we can tell somebody how to get saved, before we can share with somebody how they can know Christ. Before, listen, all you and I are called to do is tell somebody else what's happened to us. You know what? It's, it, it, it's like, that, like that guy in Acts. Hey, you guys figure it out. You're more wise than I am. You're smarter. You're more knowledgeable than I am. Here's what I know. I know this. Once I was blind, and now I see. You take it from there. You figure it out. And they got all upset. But they, <laughs> they could not convince him anything else. Because he sat as a blind man for years and years. And now he can see, right? The lame man sat at the gates for years and years. Who did this? Who did? Hey, you figure it out. All I know is I was, I was lame from birth, and now I can walk. There's been a major transformation. And you and I are to bear witnesses to that. This is what God has done for me. Theologically, you want to argue and debate? You know what? Have at it. I know that when I trusted Christ as my Savior, there was a radical, radical change in my life. And <clears throat> the thing is, <laughs> they need to be able to see that. Amen? They need to be able to see that. I think, I think we, so, we so get caught up in trying to in, 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 in trying to meet somebody else's standards, okay? You shouldn't have to guess whether or not I love my wife. If you observe my wife and I together, it should be obvious. Those two people love one another. You don't even have to know that we're married. You should be able to see those two people, they got something. There's, there's something between them two. And then you might say, I hope they're married to each other. And that's the way it ought to be between you and Jesus Christ. The world ought to be able to look at you in the circumstances of everyday life and go, they got something different. They got a relationship that I don't have. They've got, a, they've got a friend that I don't have. They have a savior. They have a relationship with Almighty God that I don't have. And there ought to be an obvious difference. And that's a great thing for you to examine in your own life. Is that difference obvious? Or do we go through life incognito? Like, we can fit into a crowd, and nobody would ever know. And I think that, you know, for the most part, very few of us like to stand out in a crowd intentionally. You know, there's, there's a few people around that, that will dress in a way that they'll stand out in a crowd. Oh, I'm sorry, Cody, did I look your way? Yeah. <laughs> there's very few people, you know, you, you, you'll see somebody every once in a while that just really dressed in a way that they're, they want to attract attention to themselves. Most of us, we just like to like fit into the crowd, right? Well, in a spiritual sense, that ought never be the case. Not that you're deliberately trying to stand out in a crowd, but it ought to become obvious. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said that if the Holy Spirit lives in you, or he lives in me, that the Holy Spirit's going to flow through me, that I'm to be a conduit to everybody around me. And while I may not understand that, 
The people around me, wherever I am, ought to be experiencing in a supernatural way this free flowing of the Spirit of God and the power of God flowing through me to impact their life. The Spirit of God ought to be working in your life and my life so powerfully and in the lives of the people around because you do realize God's always at work around us. That that Holy Spirit ought to be able to draw people to you. And you and I need to be sensitive enough to know when that's happening and be aware of those conversations that that's not just a everyday normal conversation. Hi, how you doing? Hi, you know, and, and you can see that sometimes if you say key phrases. You know, when I'm in a restaurant, I generally like to ask the, the, the waiter or the waitress, you know, we're going to pray for our food. And when we pray, how could we pray for you? Just asking that question. I've seen some pretty incredible things transpire. I remember one time sitting at a restaurant and I asked that question and the lady just started bawling. And I was like, oh my gosh, what in the world is going on here? I mean, she just lost control. And she had to, she had to sit down in the, in the booth across from my wife and I and gather herself. And then she just opened up. And man, the Spirit of God just was able to minister to her in a super powerful way. And things like that happen. You and I, that should, that, they, they, that should be going on. So the question is, <laughs> wow, this isn't even part of the lesson. Are, are we damming up that conduit of the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we damming that up because of sin in our lives? Because we've got unconfessed sin. Because you and I can quench the Holy Spirit of God. We can, we, we, we can shut that off because of our own sin. Again, the nation of Israel was a perfect example of that. But you and I can do that. So that was kind of free. Don't, you know, check up on your life. The second thing that happened in Christ's first time, to get back on track, was the discipleship of 12 men to take his message to the world. All right? He commissioned his disciples, that great commission that we talked about. And... and and so when Jesus Christ came the first time again, leading up to the church age and passing into that dispensation, that consistency of God uh, and, and the fact that God's plan never changed is important. All right. So we know that the discipleship is clear and, and his mandate is, is consistent. The third thing we should be at letter C. Go to the next one. Mandate is clear, consistent. Here we go. Let us see. It is consuming. Everybody with us on the notes now, all right? Trying to keep up, all right? So God's mission is consuming. The implication of God's mandate are overwhelming and indeed should consume us. It should consume the total focus of our lives. It should consume the focus of our churches. Uh, it, it really, if ever this statement is true, it's now. There's no time for games. There's just absolutely no time for games. Our mandate is to make disciples of all nations. That's our mandate. That's what God has called us to do. To disciple all nations is nothing short of the same kind of hard work it is in parenting. How many of you have raised children? You have, you have adult children. Okay. How many of you are currently raising children? All right. How many of you find that the job was easy or is easy? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It's easy because I don't do anything. <laughs> that was a guy. That's easy. I don't do anything. She does it all. Uh, parenting's not easy. And parenting is a 24 hour a day job, right? You never stop parenting. Especially, I mean, as kids are living in your house and they're growing up and you're growing them to maturity. And hopefully, if you're raising children, you understand that your job is not to raise them to stay home. Your job is to raise them to leave. Moms, your job is to raise them to leave. Okay? Really, I don't want to counsel any more people whose mom raised them to stay and then you have problems and you're coming for counseling because you don't know how to get rid of that kid you raised or they're coming for counseling because they have mother issues, all right? Parents, raise your children to leave. 
You raise them to want to stay, but you raise them to leave. You prepare them, you coach them, and then you counsel them, and then you consult them, and then you're a colleague with them. Right now, I have the privilege of of having that stage where I'm a colleague to my daughter and my son. You know, I'm still their parent, and I've always let them know when they were growing up, I will always be your parent. I don't care how old you are. If I see you making stupid, unwise decisions, I'm going to let you know. But as a, and they reached a point where I said, listen, you're going to hear me. Your decisions are your own decisions. You're responsible for your actions. Now I'm not. I'm transferring that baton to you sometime in those teenage years where I went from coaching them to, to, to counseling them. The difference in a coach is a coach is hands-on. A coach takes the bat in the arms of the, uh, and, and teaches them, or the golfer or whatever. And then a counselor is like, okay, you do it, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you instruction. I'm going to give you input. I'm going to show you all the positive things you did, and, and I, I may point out some things you could do to improve. And then a consultant is when they turn around and they call you and say, I need help. Can you help me? Can you work with me on this? And then a colleague is somebody that you're working side by side. And I'm, for the most part, at that stage with my two grown adults, and I got six grandkids, and, and you know, just, it's, it's, a, it's a joy to reach that point. But I told them, I'm, I'm raising you to leave. I'm not kicking you out. But God did not intend you to stay here in my household for your whole life. And so my job as a parent is to train them and prepare them to go out. And man, it was a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week job. Until I reached that point where I began to pass that baton and then they began to to make those decisions. And I guarantee you, sometimes it's hard. You want to step in before they make the decision because you can see that they're already heading in the wrong way. But you got to let them go. Just like when they were learning to walk, you had to let them take a step and fall a couple of times. They had to skin their knees. But that's, you know, that's, that's how they learned. And it's the same way. Spiritually. You've got to invest in the life of people, and it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, you know, he didn't meet with them once a week. He didn't say, I'll see you next Sunday. Or, you know, we're going to set this up, and we'll meet every other week, and, and, and we'll go through this. I think one of the problems in our discipleship ministries is that they're not a ministry, they're a program. We're going to get to that and talk about what that is not. But this this commission from God, this mandate from God is all-consuming. Let me ask you this. Uh, How many of you profess to be saved? Okay. How many of you, since the day you got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ has left you? Oh. Oh. You mean he's always there? He's always with you? He like has never left you? He never forsaken you? He never took a vacation? He never walked away and said, I'll see you next week? Ah, that means that from God's perspective, from the Lord's perspective, his relationship with you and I is all consuming, is it not? The next question is, our relationship with him all consuming? Or have you relegated your relationship with Jesus Christ to one day a week? Or two or three times a week? Or whenever you feel like it? You see, this mandate for discipleship is serious business. It's God's heartbeat, and it is all-consuming. To disciple nations, to disciple people, get it in your head, is no different than parenting. And it takes all of your effort So the first thing I want us to realize is discipleship is not an activity, it's an attitude. It's an attitude that we have to take to heart. 2 Corinthians 12, 15, And I will verily gladly spend and be spent for you, Paul said. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So here again, writing that wonderful church at Corinth and all the issues that they had and all the corruption and all the, and all the worldly endeavors and the mindset. And, and in all fairness, if you go back and you study Corinth and you study the culture that was there at the time, this Corinthian church had a major challenge. These people that lived in the Corinthian culture of sin and, and, and sex and lust and, 
personal gratification and all that. When they got saved, were, there was a radical challenge for them, just like perhaps in some of your lives. You know, some of us were raised, like I said, I was raised in the church home. That, you know, that, that, but, but some were not. And if you got saved after you, you became an adult, you know, and lived in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that was more like the Corinthian church, there's a whole different set of struggles, and they had some struggles. And so Paul was saying, look, I just want you to know, man, I'll be spent for you. I'm, I'll, I'll give you my all. But the, it seems like the more I do, the less I'm loved. And in chapter 8, he says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. He goes, I, I want you to know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor. Jesus Christ and his love consumed him for us, and he became poor for your sake and my sake. Amen? John 15, Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you what? Love one another. And what was the example? As I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We're not talking about motion, but we're talking about meaning. We're talking about real. We're talking about authentic. We're talking about genuine. We're talking about sacrifice. I always ask, I have found asking myself this question has helped me. If I am supposed to love other people the way Jesus Christ has loved me, it does me a lot of good to examine and evaluate just how has he loved me. How has Christ loved me? And am I reciprocating that to other people? How patient has he been with me? And am I that patient with other people? How long-suffering has Jesus Christ been with me in my, my relationship with him? And am I demonstrating that same long-suffering towards other people? How has Christ treated me? Am I truly treating other people that way? And, you know, we just, we need to set the attitude in our mind that especially when we get involved in, in, in mentoring other people. Listen, you, you probably heard the saying, Jesus Christ didn't save you to sit, he saved you to serve. Amen? If, if all there was in this life, if evangelism, if salvation was the end game, then why didn't God just take us home immediately after he got saved? Maybe left one or two specially called people, specially challenged, you know, with a mission to go out and preach the gospel and evangelize. But everybody else, as soon as you got saved, boom, you're out of here. Okay, end game, game's over, victory's won, let's go. But the fact of the matter is that didn't happen. Because just like birth, that's just the beginning for what God's called you and I to do. And it has to be that mindset. We have to realize that this needs to be authentic. Just like your relationship with Jesus Christ, and let me challenge you to ask yourself this, how authentic is your relationship with Jesus Christ? How about your conversation with Him? Is it relegated to a specific time of day, to a certain phraseology? Is your conversation with the Lord just like, okay, I, you know, I have, I, have this, I have this time, this is when I talk to God? But the rest of the day, I mean, he never crosses your mind. There's no conversation between you and him. I mean, how authentic is that? I mean, is that the way if you, if you have a relationship with a friend? Is that the way you, your friendship is? Or if you're married? You know, you, okay. So my wife and I talk every night from 7 to 7.15. She tells me about her day, and, and I nod, and, you know, and I'm, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, how do you feel about that? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. All right, well, I'm, I'm glad you had a good day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Great authentic relationship, right? I mean, it's just like, wow, those two are tight. I mean, if that was true in my life and you knew that, you'd be like, dude, you, you guys are missing out on, 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 on some powerful potential in a personal relationship with each other. I mean, if that's the kind of relationship you have, you know, you, you talk every... By the way, we, we do talk every night. 
All right? But that isn't the only time we talk. But if that was the only time, we'd be missing out. If that's the only time you're talking to God, whenever it is, you're missing out. You see that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? It's 24-7. It's all the time. And He so desires that fellowship with you, and you ought to desire that fellowship with Him. And the reason we don't have that kind of fellowship is because we have relegated our relationship with Jesus Christ to a little corner of our heart, to a little corner of our life. And then we have all these other categories, and men are especially good at this. We can so categorize our life that we have our spiritual life with Jesus, and then we have our, we have our, <laughs> we have our sports life, our hobby life, we have our work life, we have our wife life, we have our kids life, we have life, we have our sin life, we have our, you know, our private little sin closet. And you know, so all these things are categorized because that's how God made minds, uh, the men, minds of men, right? We have like a, you ever see those, those toolboxes you know, in the garage and nice big red things and they got all these drawers, okay? Well, that's how men think. We pull out one drawer at a time, right? And, 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 and so you deal with whatever's in that drawer. When you're done, you put it back and you close the drawer, all right? So that's how we think. Ladies, if you don't know that and, and you're married, you know, and, and, you, and your husband just sitting in the chair and you look at him and go, what are you thinking? And he goes, nothing. Nothing. As a woman, you're going like, that is impossible. You can't be thinking of nothing. And I want you to know, ladies, yes, he can. <laughs> we have a nothing drawer. And I'm going to tell you, when we pull out that nothing drawer, ain't nothing there. <laughs> and we can sit there and just think about nothing. Amen, guys? And it's bliss. And if you try to communicate when the nothing drawer is out, you ain't getting nothing. <laughs> because we have disengaged this thing. All right? Ladies, yours is like a spool of thread with multiple colors of threads. You got red and green and orange and blue and turquoise and pink and brown and, and all the different shades. And every one of those colors is a whole different thought pattern. And yet all those thought patterns are all together. Right? Yeah. And you can go from... And I'm just like, wait, 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 stop. I mean, my mother passed away a couple of years ago, but, you know, I used to, I used to love to sit. She was in her 80s, 90s, and, and we would sit and talk, and, and, and we'd, be, we'd be, you know, talking about something. And then and we'd be talking about maybe what I was doing at work. And then she'd go, so, and she'd bring up the grocery store. So did you do this? You think, Mom, we're, we're talking about work. What, what's that got to do with work? Seriously, tell me, how, how did you make that transition? And sh she could say, well, we were talking about this, and it reminded me of this, and it connected <laughs> over here, and it reminded me about your brother, and it reminded your brother told your sister that she liked this at the grocery store, and I was wondering if you went to the grocery store and got that. Now, I'm talking about my work, and we're over here at a grocery store, and I missed all of that interconnection, right? That's the way you, ladies are. And that's not, not a bad thing. That's just different. But, man, if you've got, <laughs> if you have problems, well, that might help. But in our relationship with Christ, men, you've got to be real careful. Give him access to the whole toolbox. Every single drawer all the time. Ladies, he needs to be all-consuming. And it's got to be authentic. Discipleship is not just an activity. Going to, going to, going to a, a, a study class is an activity. Going to a bowling league is an activity. Uh, playing golf is an activity. Okay? Well, that can be all-consuming, too, if you're not careful. Right, Jim? Yeah. But, you know... But discipleship is not... It, it starts with an attitude. Second of all, discipleship is not a program. It's a philosophy of ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you that as ye receive not the grace of God in vain, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things... Approving ourselves as the minister of God in much patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses. Notice all the things that he's including, okay? 
all the things that he's including here, in stripes, imprisonments, and tumults, and labors, in watchings, and fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as chastened and not killed sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things his whole philosophy was in every element and every aspect of life we're involved in this it is a, a an all-consuming philosophy of ministry john 1 17 says for the law was given by moses but grace and truth came by jesus christ the Bible says Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. The very heartbeat of Jesus Christ was to demonstrate that grace and that truth. He demonstrated it with the woman at the well versus the Pharisees. He demonstrated that grace and truth with the lepers versus the rich young ruler, the blind men versus the miracle seekers and those that were profit makers. He demonstrated that whole philosophy of ministry by not going to the status quo, by not going to those that people expected him to go to. They expected him to go to the rich. They expected him to go to the, to the religious leaders. They expected him to, to appease those that, that you know, wanted to, to make him famous. Jesus didn't want to be famous. He wanted to be real. He wanted everybody that, that he came in contact with to experience that grace and that truth. And it was, it was the, his heartbeat. Discipleship isn't, isn't a, isn't a hard-covered book, like a notebook, or some kind of publication. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is the heartbeat of a believer. It's the philosophy of life. I told you back when I was in high school, I read this book by the Navigators. They're published by the Navigators. And, 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 and it, was, it was a foundation by Troutman about discipleship. And <clears throat> what I had been reading in my Bible and, 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 and what I read in that book, he like reinforced, he was, he was, he was helping me understand that this whole concept of, of discipleship permeated every area of life. And while we have a discipleship process, it's not a process that ever stops, like being a parent never stops. All right? Being a parent is ongoing. And, and, and discipleship is this philosophy that's got to continue on in our life. It's got to be our heartbeat. Uh, we have, uh, we talk about uh, the different phases. We start out the on-ramp at our church as like many churches, it's called cost of discipleship. We're exp we explain to new believers, this is what it means to be a disciple. You see, everybody that's saved is not a disciple. But every true disciple of Christ is saved. And Jesus had people come to him and says, man, I want to be a disciple. I want to be a disciple. I want to, I want to be a follower. And he goes, well, let me, let me help you understand. And Luke 9 is a perfect example. Like, if you want to be a follower of me, this is what you need to do. There is a cost involved. And we explain that to people. We, we explain, look, it, you're about to make a decision. And we want you to know that, that there are things involved in that. And then we go through what we call life on life, where we pair them up with somebody where that person has agreed to basically invest in their life. pour themselves not just through 18 lessons, but the goal is to accomplish, the purpose is to accomplish three goals. You know, to, to, to achieve those goals more than to gain the knowledge. Be aware of that. Be careful that you maintain that philosophy. Okay? Because the next point is that discipleship is not just a series of lessons but it is a way of life. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. 
rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. But that phrase, so walk ye in him, that's a continual process, okay? We're in this life and we're in a walk with Christ. And that walk doesn't stop until he calls us home. Amen? And so we need to walk in Christ. Then he goes on and expounds, be rooted, be built up in him, be established in the faith. He says in another place, always abounding, okay? Be, be steadfast and unmovable, be rooted, be built up in him. But it's a way of life. It's that, it's that walk that's so critical that, that doesn't stop. From the day you got saved, you know, you, you started walking with Christ. That doesn't end in this life until he calls us home. And it's critical that we understand that the discipleship, it's a walk. It's a way of life. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And then the two by four, right between the eyeballs. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. You know what Jesus was saying? Follow my walk and love one another like I have loved you. Hey, have you ever studied those 12 disciples? You think any of those dudes were unlovable? You think any of those fellas, Jesus was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Again? Or like, Thomas, really? Thomas, have you, have you not learned anything? Okay, I mean, like, and, and then, I'm not even getting to Judas. But Jesus loved Judas, too. And the key is that he says, this is how the world's going to know that you're one of my followers, that, that you identify with me. It's not because you tell people, hey, you know, I, I, I'm a member of such and such a church. Okay, I do this, I do that. No, it's by your pattern of discipleship. It's by your way of life. It's by how you carry about yourself every single day. And I'm just going to tell you this. If you're not mentoring someone, if you're not discipling someone, if you're not pouring your life into someone, are you really a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you just saved? You know, Paul writes in Corinthians, he goes, yeah, there's some, they're saved. As so if by fire, like they're at the judgment seat of Christ and everything that they've done is consumed. It's all wood, hay, and stubble. Oh, they're still saved, but they got nothing to show for it. Because when they got saved, they sat down and they just became satisfied eating and just let other people feed them. You see, that's not what the Christian life is all about. That's not what the abundant life is all about. You know, people say all the time, now, how many of you are grandparents? Okay. Grandparenting is great, isn't it? And you say, oh, grandparenting is great because you get to spend time with the kids and then you can leave. All right. But that's not what makes grandparenting great. What makes grandparenting great is when you can see what you have invested in your children being reproduced in your grandchildren. What makes grandparenting a pain is when you see what you have vested in your children being reproduced in your grandchildren. You get that? Because whatever you invested in your children is being transferred to your grandchildren, and that either brings great joy or that brings unbelievable heartbreak because it only reinforces that you failed to do your job as a parent. Now apply that spiritually. Do you have grandchildren spiritually? Do you have great-grandchildren spiritually? Do you have great-great-grandchildren spiritually? Have you, have you 
Have you poured your life into somebody else and then they've turned around and, and taken what you've invested in them and, and you can see them investing in the lives of other people and, and they're investing in the lives of other people. And, you know, I, it, it's really interesting to see some of these family pictures, you know, where you got where you got the where you get the. The, the matriarch and the patriarch, you know, and they're here in front, and then, and then you got the two or three kids or four kids or sometimes more, and then you got their grandkids and then maybe the great-great-grandkids, and you got this whole clan together, and it's just like, that's incredible. Well, spiritually, are you working on that? Are you letting the Lord Jesus Christ use you in your walk to invest and pour in the lives of other people? Are, are, are other people following your walk? Are other people, you know, responding to the way you love them and they're turning around and loving one another? Discipleship isn't just words. It's a daily walk. And I'm going to say, it isn't always easy any more than parenting was easy. All right? Fourthly, discipleship is not education only. It's edification and exhortation. It's edification and exhortation. <clears throat> Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Edifying one another. Let all your speech be seasoned with grace, that you may edify the hearers. Let your speech, all of it, should be edifying to other people. We should be edifying and exhorting one another. Hebrews 3 says, but exhort one another daily. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. Hey, you know what? <laughs> God has given you today. The opportunities you have today, you will never have tomorrow. The opportunities to encourage and exhort and edify one another will be missed, and you can't go back tomorrow. We have a perfect illustration. One of our missionaries, his father, passed away this morning. All the things that he might have wanted to say to his dad, if he didn't say them, he won't have that opportunity again. And I know him, and I know he talked to his dad, and I know that that relationship, but, you know, that's why death, when we're faced with death, it brings to the very forefront of our life our mortality. That's why a funeral service, in my opinion, just personally for me, I'm not trying to be morbid, but I would rather preach at a funeral service than any other opportunity in this life. Because it's there that I know that people sitting in that audience have come face to face with their mortality. Somebody, they're there because somebody close to them, either a relative or a friend, somebody has just passed from this life to the next, and they're sitting realizing, someday that's going to be me. And God forbid if we ever have an opportunity to share at a funeral and we don't share the saving grace of Jesus Christ. God forbid if ever there's an opportunity. Now, they're not always easy. I'm telling you, I've done a funeral of infants. That is not easy. But boy, I'll tell you what it does. It makes everybody realize that death is not a respecter of persons. Death can come anytime. And it could come to one of us today. It came to someone very close to some of us today. And <clears throat> we need to make sure that today is the day that we have the opportunity for edification and exhortation while it is called today. You know, when you consider the final word of the Lord before his crucifixion in John chapter 14, the very final words as he's hanging on the cross in John 14, he, he, he talks about promise and care. He turns to John and he says, promise me this and, and, and care for my mother. These are the things that I want to leave with you. And then in John 14, he talks about it to, to the disciples, look at I promise you this, I'm going to come again, and I'm going to take care of you even between now and then. And then he says, I'm going to send a comforter to his disciples. I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm not going to leave you alone, and I'm going to send you a comforter. And then in John 16, he goes, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
Why? I have overcome the world. Wow. Our pastor preached yesterday. He started out with doom and gloom. He got up in the pulpit and he goes, man, the, the world is in a mess. It's just, it's just a nightmare. And then he just, he, he began to just relate everything that's going on in the world. The wars here and the rumors of wars here and the battles here and the, and the invasions here and the struggles here and the diseases here. And, the, and you know, and I'm sitting there going, wow, this is, this is edifying. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged. And you know, a whole lot of people, that's why they go to church. You know, they, they want to walk out of the doors going, man, I feel good. And, and so they walk by the pastor and they go, man, that was a great message. You, it was really edifying. That really lifted me up. Of course, for a preacher like ours, that's not his purpose. He really doesn't want you to walk out and say, man, that was good. I enjoyed that. Now, that wasn't my purpose, but thank you. I hope you caught the purpose. Joe's purpose yesterday wasn't to make us feel good. It wasn't to make us feel bad. But the challenge was, are you facing reality of what's going on? Do you know where you are to the fact that we need to redeem the time? And you and I need to realize that, that the discipleship isn't just a process of education. It's, it's, it's a matter of edifying and exhorting one another and not a degree that people earn or not a certificate, although we give out a certificate and say, hey, man, you've gone through this step of the process and we applaud you and we encourage you, but this is just part of the process. Let's just keep growing. But rather, it's a desire, a desire to edify and to exhort one another. You know, Hebrews chapter 10 a lot of preachers love the passage of Scripture that says, Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. And why? Because, unfortunately, in most cases, they're number counters. And they want you to come to church so they can, you can be counted. But I don't want you to be a member that, that, that is counted. I want you to be a follower of Christ that counts, that makes a difference. You know, be a difference maker in your life. Don't just get caught up in a discipleship ministry where you're teaching something and you go, okay, well, I taught him his 18 lessons. Now you're next. Now I got your 18 lessons. Check the box. Now you're next. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to go through the 18 lessons and I'm going to give you all sorts of Bible knowledge. No. It's a matter of exhorting one another. It's a matter of edifying one another and helping people grow. So it brings us to the fifth thing the disciple is not. It is not just teaching. It is life reproduction. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach other also. Almost the heartbeat or the theme verse of all biblical discipleship. There's the process. Take faithful men and invest in them and teach them so that they can turn and invest in others. It's that reproduction factor. It's that going on. If you invest in somebody, if you've discipled them and they're not investing in others, can I challenge you to go back to them and say, what did I do wrong? What, what did I do wrong? Why, why aren't you taking that and investing in someone else? Don't figure you did your job, and then if they're not doing their job, well, that's, that's, that's on them. It is, but don't you care more than that? Did you really invest in them for nothing? Philippians 4.9 says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then what's the next word? Do. That's the heartbeat for you and I. That's, that's what we ought to be. I, I want to teach you. I want you to receive it. I want you to hear it. I want you to see it in my life. And then I want to encourage you to do it. And the God of peace shall be with you. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says in verse 1, Be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Okay? Reproduce your life in someone else, like he did the 12, like he did in Nicodemus. It wasn't just an exposition, but an exhibition of Christ in you. It's, it's, it's the authenticity. You're not just exposing, you're not just talking about it, but... You're demonstrating it, and you're reproducing it, and you're bringing it forth, okay? Number six, discipleship is not a manual, but it's a ministry. 
Again, it's your heart to the heart of another. 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 8, 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospi- But don't you love that phrase? Don't you love that truth? Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. How many of your sins has the love of Jesus Christ covered? And I'm not talking about before you got saved. I'm not talking about your sin nature. I'm talking about after you got saved, the fact that we still deal with the flesh, we still battle with the flesh, we still sin. But it's the love of Christ, according to 1 John 1, 9, that He will forgive us, and His love covers that multitude of sins. Amen? You you don't have to confess. I know nobody in this room has lived a, a sinlessly perfect life after you got saved. And so it's good to realize, man, thank you, Lord. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it, go back to your childhood. You know, how many times did you mess up the same way over and over and over again? Now, indeed, maybe you had to pay the price for that, but mom and dad still loved you. If you grew up in a loving home like I did, you know, I, it didn't matter how many times I messed up. Certainly there was a price to pay. Certainly there was the chastisement. Certainly there was the instruction. And then at times there was the scourging. There was that paddling. There was that go to your room and wait till your dad gets home. I hated that phrase. Go to your room and wait till your dad gets home. But mom, it's only one o'clock in the afternoon. Go to your room. You pass the line. <laughs> my chastisement, my discipline ain't going to cut the mustard. But you know what? No matter what happened, I knew mom and dad loved me because I was blessed to be raised in a home where mom and dad loved me. And <clears throat> that love covered a multitude of sins. I remember one time I really blew it. And uh, I, uh, I, I was throwing rocks at somebody's window. And it was just a shed as far as I was concerned. It was on my way to school and it was an old shed and, you know, who cares? And so my buddy and I, we'd pick up rocks as we were walking up the alley to, to elementary school. And, you know, we'd, we'd, if you're in New York, you'd shoot the rocks. If you're from the Midwest, you throw the rocks. And, and you know, if you're from down south, you might, I don't know, toss the rocks or chuck, chuck them. There you go. Thank you. I, the, <laughs> chuck the rock. Well, we did all of them. You know, we threw them, we tossed them, we chucked them, we, you know, we shoot them. And, man, we were good. We were nailing those little panes of glass. And so in, in day one, you know, we're like, okay, we're going to aim for the upper left-hand corner. And, and, man, we'd throw those rocks and then take off, run around the corner and across the field and into the schoolyard, and we were safe. Okay? And then the next day, you know, we're good, the next pain. And so this went on for two or three days. And, uh, of course, stupid us, we developed a pattern. So the day came, and we're throwing the rocks, you know, and, man, the glass is shattered, and we're running around the corner, and out steps the guy. And his arms were like elastic arms. And somehow he was able to reach out and grab both of us by the shirt collars as we ran by and said, boys, come with me. And he walked us across the schoolyard, right up into the principal's office. Well, <clears throat> there was a price to pay for that. That was, that was a big price. But you know, I knew that I was going to pay the price, and I was going to be in trouble, and I most likely was going to pay for that guy's windows, too. And I was going to do yard work and whatever I had to do and raise the money, and I I knew I was going to have to pay. But I also knew in my heart that no matter how upset Mom and Dad might be, I was still loved. My buddy, not so much. He didn't grow up in a home where he knew his dad loved him. And we were outside playing, and this guy got our names and our addresses from the school. And I remember the day when we're playing and we see this car turn the corner down our street. And we both recognized him. And we both took off and hid. Well, my hiding didn't last very long. But he hid, hid. And I mean, nightfall came. And they couldn't find him. Because he didn't have that peace that mom and dad loved him. 
And he feared for his life because as the old proverb said, or not proverb, but the old saying, he had been beat within the inch of his life before. And he figured this time it was over. And so he actually went and hid. And they had to call the police. And they started searching all the neighborhood and they looked everywhere. And, and back in those days when we grew up in Colorado, you had an incinerator in your backyard by the alley. And you took your raw garbage and you put it in a garbage pail and the garbage truck came down and took that raw garbage and threw it in the garbage pail. And then they took it out and they actually took it to pig farmers and they, they fed that to the pigs. But your, your trash, your paper trash, you actually put in the incinerator and burnt it right there in your backyard in this concrete incinerator. Well, the house behind him had been empty for a while and he actually climbed inside that incinerator and hid in there. And I mean, he wasn't coming out. He was scared to death because he didn't understand that charity covereth a multitude of sins. In my relationship with Jesus Christ, I am so thankful that his love continues to cover that multitude of sins. That doesn't mean there isn't a price that I pay, but it's not eternal. Amen? It's not, I've lost my salvation. It's not, okay, you're, you're no longer a part of the family. We disown you because it's that love. You know where people learn that? They learn that through discipleship. They learn that through biblical, true, authentic discipleship. They learn that, not necessarily in today's world, from a home of loving parents. Because more and more and more families don't experience any of that kind of love. More and more people, and no doubt some of you sitting in this room, did not grow up in a home like I've described with loving parents and godly parents. And so when people get saved, they have a hard time relating to a heavenly father that loves them. They don't understand that loving relationship between a father and a son or a father and a daughter. And they struggle in their spiritual walk because that is a foreign concept to them. I don't know what that means. The only relationship I had with my dad was when I got in trouble or my dad abandoned us. And so I don't even know what it means to be loved by a father. And when you talk about a heavenly father that loves you, listen, people can relate to, I was dead in my trespasses and sins and I realized by the Holy Spirit that I was going to die and split hell wide open and Jesus Christ came to save me. But that thing about being adopted into the family of God, being joint heirs with Jesus, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, like, like he's, my, he's my stepbrother and, and I've got the same inheritance as him. I'm like in Christ and I have a heavenly father. That's foreign. I don't understand that. Well, where are they going to learn that? sitting in a pew on Sunday morning, going to some kind of a class on a, on a, on a, on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night? No, they're going to learn that by you or by me investing in their life in a loving manner and sharing that love that we've experienced from our Heavenly Father and passing that on to the next generation. Amen? Amen. That's true discipleship. That's Jesus taking 12 men who came from all walks of life and pouring into their life and loving them as the heavenly Father loved him. As the Father sent me, so send I you. How is the world going to know that you're my disciples? Because you love one another. You know who he was talking to? He was talking to Matthew. And Matthew's relatives, who are a part of that crowd, who had rejected him because he became a tax collector. You realize when Matthew, in order to get ahead in this world, accepted the job of a tax collector, he was disowned by his family, and I believe he was related to Jesus Christ. I believe Matthew was his cousin in this physical world, and his family had chalked up Matthew as dead. They probably, no doubt, had had an actual funeral for Matthew because he was a tax collector. He had chose to get the wealth of this world rather than stick with his Jewish family. And so when Jesus went to Matthew and said, follow me, I'll, make, I'll accept you. I'll make you one of mine. And Matthew followed him. <laughs> you know, you read that, and Matthew went to, Jesus went to Matthew's house, Oh, and it says, and his disciples. Where do you think the disciples were? They weren't inside enjoying the party, I guarantee you that, because 
I know that because the Pharisees came to the disciples. And what did the Pharisees say to the disciples? Anybody remember? Why is your master eating with them? Not, why are you eating with them? You missed that? Those guys weren't in there. They were following Jesus, but man, they weren't going to go in and sit down because culturally they had rejected Matthew. He was a turncoat. He was a traitor. He was the despicable of the most despicable in their eyes. And Jesus is in there and the Pharisees came and they're like, hey man, you guys agree with us. Why is your master in there eating? Of course, Jesus perceived. He knew what they were thinking. He goes, hey guys, why don't you ask me? Because I came to save that which was lost like Matthew, who is rejected. So now, two or three years later, he's, he's passing this torch, and he's saying, Matthew, be sure you invest in the life of someone else that's been rejected, that's been turned away, that's been an outcast, someone who's been unlovable as far as the world standards are concerned, and let them know the love of the Heavenly Father. Let them know about that special relationship. We can only pass that on as we pour and invest in the lives of other people. That is the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. That's biblical discipleship. That's when you go through and realize that, that it's, it's a ministry to build men, not using men to build a ministry. It's a ministry where you build women, not use women to build a ministry. Not use people in order to, to, to build your heritage, to build your legacy, to, to build the numbers. But your whole purpose is to pour into their life and build them as people. To build that person as an individual. To encourage them, to meet them, to challenge them. And I'm telling you, it, it's true in my life. It's going to be true in your life if it's not already. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to get fed up. You're... You, the, you're going to want to give up on them, and you're like, well, if you're not interested, I'm not interested. Well, okay, but why aren't they interested? What are they struggling with? What is it that they don't grasp that maybe you grasp, and you need to be a little more patient? At what point did Jesus Christ give up on you? I'm not talking about before you got saved. I'm talking about since you got saved. At what point has Christ given up on you? At one point did he say, well, okay, hey, listen, <laughs> I will never what? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So even why, because of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you and I choose to sin. And we choose to reject Him. We, we choose not to listen to the Word of God, not to pray, not to fellowship with Him, not to, you know, not to spend time with Him. He's still there. Amen? Yeah. And He still loves you. And He's still going to edify you. And He's still going to chastise you. And then he'll take you to the scourging. But he never gives up. Help us not to give up. And I'll tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is preaching to me. Larry, don't give up on people. Don't give up on that person. Encourage them and edify them and let them know you still care for them. You're still there. You know, don't, don't throw them away. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. It is a ministry to build people. And you can't build them if you're not investing in them. And if you only look at people as to add to your numbers and to grow your church, and, and you only, like the, you only like, like the good ones, you only like the ones that conform to your image, and you're not worried about getting them to conform to his image, then we've got this thing all wrong, which leads us right to the next step. Discipleship is not a rapid growth formula. It's a long-lasting relationship. Discipleship is a long-lasting relationship. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about biblical discipleship. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, But we were gentle among you, Paul said, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. 
He said, we poured our lives into you. Our, our, we gave you our souls. We invested in you. Philippians 2, he says in verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ. But ye know the proof of him, talking about Timothy, as a son with the father, he has served me in the gospel. You see, Timothy was a perfect example of, of the disciple that, that Paul had. Paul ministered to him, he discipled him, he trained him, he poured his life into him as he did others, and he refers to them as they're not like-minded. You read in some of the letters where, well, this guy left, and this guy left, and this guy loves this world, and this guy made this decision, and I still care for them, but I'm going to send you Timothy because Timothy's like-minded, and, and, and he's proof of this whole process. And it's a long-lasting relationship. And you and I are going to have people, unfortunately, who no matter what you do, they're going to make decisions and, and they're going to go the other way. And you can read in the New Testament where there are those that went that and, and Paul and, and Paul had some division with them, but then later on there was a, a, a reuniting. There was a coming back together and a growing and ministering together. And there's always that possibility. But don't be discouraged because somebody makes a decision and says, I'm not coming anymore, I'm not going to do this anymore, or this is more than I, than I bargained for, or this is, this is more than I thought it was all about. Listen, a discipleship following the Lord Jesus Christ is serious business. It's, it's, it, it, it's not a game. It's not, you know, just something that, that you can have fun doing. True biblical discipleship is a long is building a long lasting relationship. John 14 verses 15 through 18 Jesus talks about sending the comforter. He says I'm going to send the comforter and he's going to he's going to teach you and he's going to guide you and he's going to instruct you, right? And it, 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 so building a mentorship is is again not like a microwave but rather like a campfire. You know, you you can you ever pop popcorn over a campfire? Anybody ever do that? Do you, you do any of that anymore? Like, uh, you, you guys that haven't done it, you've missed out. I mean, really, there's nothing like popcorn popped on a, on a campfire. But you know, to get that campfire ready to pop popcorn, it takes a while. You don't just get a flame going and get it up high and then stick the, stick the pot out there, you know? It's like baking potatoes in a campfire. I mean, before you ever build a fire, you take the potato and you wrap it in aluminum foil and you dig down in the earth and, and, and you put the potatoes down there and you cover them up with earth and then you begin to build your fire. And then you light that fire and you get it going and you let it burn and you get it nice and hot and you get a whole bed of coals and then you just let those coals sit there. No big flames anymore, just the coals for a long time. And then you come back and you push away the coals and you dig out those potatoes and oh man, are they good. Well, popping popcorn's the same way. You've got to build that fire and you've got to build that whole bed of coals where, man, it's, it's hot. The, the, you know, it's, it, it's got the white down in there and, and you can just, you can get close and you can't see the flame. And boy, you feel the heat. And that's when you put the pan over there with the popcorn in it and, and, and maybe some oil and you've got to keep them moving and shaking like you do popcorn. If, you know, some of you are like, you shake a pan to make popcorn? I take, I take the paper off the outside and hit popcorn. And in less than four minutes, I got a bag full of popcorn. Yeah, no. And that's okay. I do the same thing. But when I want a good bowl of popcorn, I get out the old popcorn pan, and I get out the old buttery oil, and I get out the Orville Riddenbacher popcorn, and I get that pan on the stove, you know. And actually, I have one of those that has a little handle that turns and the, and the thing inside goes round and round. That's pretty cool, right? And man, that is a bowl of popcorn. Not a little bag of popcorn. I mean, I can fill up a bowl of popcorn. I don't eat anything for three days after that. But boy, I'm telling you, 
because I don't just put butter on that popcorn. Then I grate cheddar cheese on it, put a little hot sauce on it, and some of it. I mean, it, 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 it turns into a feast. But it's not a microwave. And building an, a long-lasting relationship and discipleship is not a microwave-type situation. It's something that takes a long time. Okay? It takes a long time. You've got to make sure that you're willing to invest that. And let me tell you this. A lot of discipleship ministries have become programs because people aren't willing to invest in that long-term relationship. They only... Listen... Hey, I'll take you through 18 lessons. Man, in, in, in 18 weeks we can be done. I'll be glad to disciple you. We'll meet once a week for an hour, and we can go through those lessons, and we're done. Man, congratulations. You stayed the course. You did it. You're discipled. Not. A lot of people don't want to become journeymen in a career, you know, because they realize, man, to be an electrician and to get my certification, that takes a long time. I mean, can I just go to school, take a two-year class at a, a junior college somewhere and come out and have my certification and, and be a certified you know, a tool and die maker? Can I go to take a few classes and then get hired and become an automatic, you know, or a welder or, or you know, better yet, how about these guys that work for the electrical company, for the, for the utilities? I didn't realize this until I was talking to some guys that work for Decatur Utilities. They were out replacing a transformer, and I'm talking to the guy standing down on the ground. You know, and I'm, I'm walking up, and I go, hey, how you doing? Yeah, good, you know, and the transformer blew out and crossed from my, our business, and so I'm talking to him, and I go, how long have you been with Decatur Utilities? And he says, oh, about 10 years. I said, really? I said, so you're not up there anymore? Oh, he says, I All right, now we're back in motion. I haven't even earned the right to be up there yet. Like, you got to be kidding. He goes, oh, no. You don't get up there and play around with that until you've been through a long process. And it takes years for me to go through the training and get to that point. And, and, and then the guys that are there, they don't just quit overnight. I mean, they've earned that right. They're staying there for a while. So it takes a while to get to that point. And he took me through the steps in the process, and I like, I had no idea. He goes, yeah, no, you know, you see up here at the, at the junior college, you know, they go through and they have that training, and that's good, and they learn how to climb a pole. And how, he goes, that's for some of that work. When you get up playing with that kind of voltage, and you're exchanging a transform, I said, so how do they do that without turning all the power off? He looked at me and go, we don't turn the power off. I was like, okay, now I know. you got to be kidding me. He goes, no, and he told me how many volts are up there live. And I go, okay, you really want to do that? He goes, I do. You know, that's kind of like people that, that go into the fire department. You ever realize that firemen don't run from a fire? They run into the fire? You know, it's just like, what? Why do people do that? Well, because they got that special calling and desire. You know why some people disciple, really get involved in this? It's that same heartbeat. It's that same concept. The investment is worth the effort. The training is worth the effort. And, and I'm going to invest in the lives of people because it's going to make a difference. And, and, and we're going to go on. So uh, we've got to get moving here. I'm running out of time. Discipleship is the heart of God's mandate. It's clean, it's consistent, it's consuming, all right? It also leads to the conformity to the image of Christ, all right? It leads, it's a process, it leads to the conformity of the image of Christ. We, we can go pretty quick here because this has been a part of this whole process. I keep bringing it up. The mandate is clear, all right? The answer is found in studying the word disciple. The meaning is for a learner, uh, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. I won't pretend to know how to pronounce it because I could say it, but I don't know that that's right. But that, that word that's translated is a word for learner. All right, It's to become a pupil, to become a student. It's, it's to adhere to teaching. 
A disciple is someone who comes to Jesus to learn from him. When they came and said, I want to be your disciple, he called them, and then he called them disciples. They had shown the right attitude and the hard attitude of being a learner, to be a disciple, to be transformed, okay? There's some significance to this word. All right, in the, in the, in, in the Gospels, that word is used over 230 times in the Gospels. It's found in some form in the book of Acts, that transition book to the New Testament church age, about 25 times, but the word is not used one single time in the epistles. All right? Instead, in the epistles, the word disciple is replaced by another word, and that word is saint, found 57 times. A disciple is one who learns, whereas a saint is one who is set apart, holy, and sanctified. Okay? So one is a disciple in order to learn how to live like a saint. That's one concept that we can gather from that. You, you, you are a disciple to learn how to live a consecrated, dedicated, separated, sanctified life. Okay, And the other is that the discipleship is to grow into the image of Christ. All right? You, now, not a constant, you know, you, you, you're there, and when he passed those disciples on, they went to live in the image of Christ. And so we need to become conformed to him. And in order to do that, and this is another class, these goals that we're going to talk about, where, where you invest in the life of that person and teach them how to be a worshiper of God. A true worshiper of God isn't somebody that goes to church on Sunday and sings some songs. A true worshiper of God is somebody who every single day that you wake up, you realize this is a day the Lord hath made and He has given me another day and I want to honor and glorify Him because it belongs to Him, right? We call it a present because it's a gift to us, I think. But you need to realize this is a day God has given me, but it belongs to Him. My whole day is to worship Him, to acknowledge Him, to praise Him, to serve Him. And when you disciple somebody, you're bringing them, first of all, to that point to realize life isn't all about you. Life is all about Him. And you being used by Him to live through you for His honor and glory. Amen? And then, and then we, we bring them to... to be established in the Word of God. Understanding, if that's the case, how do I know or learn, you know, what to do and what not to do? How, how do I build that relationship, okay? Like, where are the love letters? I mean, back when my wife and I were dating, like, we wrote love letters. Did you do that, guys? I hope so. Like, cards, I still got those cards like she gave me and still gives me. And, you know, like, like these, these, these love letters. It's like precious. And, and, and they reveal more about her and vice versa. These are God's love letters to you and I. And that's where you continue to learn. And the thing about it is, this is not like any other book. This is a living book. This isn't a publication. This is a book that's alive and it's brought alive every day by the Holy Spirit. As you and I open it and read it and study it, the Holy Spirit teaches you. You can read a passage of Scripture and you could have read it a hundred times. And then you'll read it again and the Holy Spirit will take one thing and jump off the page. You go, oh my, I never saw that before. You ever do that? I, I, bought, a, I, bought, a, uh, I bought a Bible that is in paragraph form. Because, you know, we, we, don't, we don't write like this. How many of you write in verse structure? Like, you write half a sentence and you put a number and then you write another half a sentence and put a number and, you know, you, no, we write in paragraph form, do we not? And you start out with a topic sentence or whatever and you write the whole paragraph and then you go to the next paragraph. Well, God's preserved his word for us in the English language and, and that's the way God wrote it. And, and so verses were added in order to help location and for study and all that, and they're all good. I got no problem with that. But man, if you can get a copy of a Cambridge, I wouldn't go anywhere else because I don't think there's another paragraph Bible that's KJV except published by Cambridge. But if you get that paragraph Bible by Cambridge and you begin to read, you're, if you do what I did, you'll be reading through there and go, wait, 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 that's not in the Bible. I mean, I, I've read the book of Matthew, you know, tons and tons of times. 
I've never seen that. And you'll go and you'll pick up this Bible that you've been reading and go to Matthew and you go, oh my, it is there. I just missed that. Because you're looking at it from a different perspective. Or just get a different publication of the Bible that's kind of different in the way it's written, in, not the words, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, because you know, you're like, I know that verse. It's over here. It's about halfway through the Old New Testament. It's on the left-hand page, left-hand column, halfway down. Yep, there it is. Because you didn't memorize the address, right? You just, you're so familiar, you know where it's at. Well, <clears throat> when you get a different Bible, then it's not the same place, and you, you, know, you just pick up different things. And the Holy Spirit can use that to go, hey, you've missed this before. But man, when you see that, and, and you start growing in the Word of God, you realize that it's alive and the Holy Spirit is teaching and using that like never before. And it builds that relationship that goes long beyond some 18 lessons or whatever that you might teach. And you get them established in the fact that the Word of God is alive and well to them. That with the indwelling Holy Spirit and the written Word of God, man, there's no holding back. Thank God for teachers and preachers. And God says, I've given to the, I've given to the church pastors and teachers and evangelists. And, and there's reasons for that and fulfilling that. But you know what? They're not your chef. We're not to be your chef spiritually. We're not the ones God called to prepare your food for you every week. And a lot of believers, that's exactly the way they look at the pastor or the teachers. The pastor or teacher goes and prepares this spiritual food for us on Sunday. And we go and we take it in, and then that's the only time we eat all week long. That's why the church is so anemic. That's why Christians are so weak and frail. Because you've gotten the mindset that, that that's pastor is supposed to prepare my spiritual food. No, 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 no. That's you and me every single day with the Spirit of God, amen, and the Word of God. This is my daily food. The, what, what's the picture? The Old Testament picture is what? The nation of Israel going out and picking up what? Manna. How often did they pick up the manna? Every day, Every day except? Sabbath. Sabbath. To them it was the Sabbath. Every day but one. And then they collected enough on the day before the Sabbath to last the Sabbath. And God didn't let it spoil. If they did that any other day, it spoiled. You want to know what he was teaching them? You got to depend on me every day. You know what it ought to be teaching us? you got to depend on Him every day. Are you in the Word of God every day? Oh, yeah, man, I read, today I read one of the Proverbs and one Psalm. Well, that's a great start. You know, it's like feeding baby pablum, a little jar of baby food. Okay, that's good. That's, that's a start. That, that's, that's all right. But, man, as you grow, Paul says, you're still babes. You're still, like, needing milk when you ought to be eating meat. That's because you're not growing. You're not letting the Holy Spirit teach you, and we need to daily. And so when you're discipling somebody, when I'm discipling Jim, I need to bring him to the point, not where he depends upon me meeting with him to feed him, but I have taught him the importance of feeding himself every day and the fact that when, he, when I'm done pouring into his life initially, he realizes I cannot exist without that, so much so that when we're meeting... He's coming and sharing with me all the cool things that God's showing him and what he's learning. Or he comes with all these questions and goes, okay, man, I've never seen this before and I've never seen that before. And, and wow, what is this word? Here, here's a word. I don't understand this. What's lascivious mean? One of my disciples came and that walked in and we're ready. And he says, hey, b before we get started, there was a word in here. I think I know what it means, but I'm not sure. What does lascivious mean? And I says, well, let's let the Bible translate it and interpret it for us, not translate us. And so we did a word study real quick, and he goes, yeah, that's what I thought. I go, really? He goes, yep, that's what I thought. I go, well, what's the deal? That's my problem. Wow. I didn't reveal that to him. The Holy Spirit taught him that. That's what he realized. The Holy Spirit is the one working in my heart and life. It's not Larry teaching me or Joe teaching me. Or, and so you get established in the Word of God, and then you establish the believer in the work of the Lord. Okay? You establish the believer in the work of the Lord, and I'm not talking about getting involved in the church, although that comes into play by all means. 
But you know, if, if, if we're building men and women, okay, if we're using the ministry to build them, then we've got to be careful not to transfer that and say, the reason I'm pouring into your life is because we need workers in our children's ministry. We need workers in our student ministry. We need workers in our praise and worship ministry. We need workers in our sound ministry. We need workers in our evangelism. You know, the reason you're here is so that we can put you to work in this church. And you know what? If you teach them right and you train them right, that's a natural. They're going to want to get involved. You know what? Like, my parents taught me, <laughs> if you sleep here and you eat here, and this is where you get your sustenance, this is where you get your food, this is where you get your allowance, then it's only a natural thing for you to get involved in the maintaining of this place and the building of this place, and the growing of this place. As a biblical principle, my parent taught me. You know, when you grow people spiritually, you don't have to, like, twist their arm and, 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 and you know, try to put the hook in their nose and somehow convince them or bribe them or pay them or threaten them to get involved in ministry. See, true biblical discipleship builds that kind of maturity, and naturally they go, wow, you know, can I do this? Can I get involved here? And when you take them alongside you when you're discipling and they see your joy for ministry and they see how you're pouring in the lives of other people, not just in, in, in their life, but in every place else in other ways, it's just a natural thing that they follow you as you follow Christ. <coughs> Absolutely. Our time is up. I don't know where we are in the notes, but we're done. One more blank? That's the measure. Oh, yeah. Well, we covered this sort of at the beginning. That's, uh, it really is. Discipleship is the heart of the measure for you, and it's the heart of the measure for your church. Discipleship is how you can know how you're doing, how you're growing, how are you learning personally, and how's your church doing. When I talk to pastors and I say, hey, man, you know, are they... Hey, I understand you guys got a discipleship program. We do too, but ours isn't doing too well. I already know probably from the very phrase that they said that we have a discipleship program that that's all they've got. They got a program. So I hope this has been a blessing and beneficial. Let me pray for us as we leave. Father, we just come to you and thank you for this time we've had together. Father, as I prayed earlier, I, I really was, I needed you to speak through me. Lord, I needed you to communicate to these people. And I pray that you did. I pray that this hasn't been time that has been a waste in any way, shape, or form for them, but that this precious time that you've given to us and they've invested has been profitable. Lord, may we have ears to hear and have hearts to obey. In Jesus' name, amen.